Hi guys, this is Ms. Romani, and for today's lesson we're going to be learning about different types of chemical bonds that play a role in biochemistry. We will also explore the topic of molecular polarity. Just like the previous lesson, some of this lesson is meant to serve as a review of information you have learned in previous chemistry courses. The section on intermolecular bonds and polarity, however, will be covered in the grade 12 chemistry course, so it will probably be new to most of you. Now, last lesson we discussed that the main goal of all atoms is stability, and that stability means having a completely filled valence shell. Neon, for example, has a completely filled valence shell with eight electrons and does not need to undergo any chemical reactions to fill it. Oxygen, on the other hand, has six electrons on its valence shell, so it needs two more to have a completely filled valence shell with eight. Oxygen is not stable, but it can actually gain stability by either gaining those two electrons from other atoms or by sharing some of the ones it has. Essentially, what happens during chemical reactions that form chemical bonds and that form compounds. So when atoms interact with each other to fill their valence shells, they will form chemical bonds. There are two main types of chemical bonds. Ionic bonds that are formed when electrons are transferred from one atom to another, and covalent bonds that are formed when electrons are shared between atoms. Let's review ionic bonding first. Ionic bonds are formed when electrons are transferred from metals to nonmetals. But why do metal atoms lose electrons and nonmetal atoms gain them? Well, if we go back and look at a section of the periodic table of elements, we can see that the metals and metalloids are on the left of this line and the nonmetals are on the right. So then metals have one, two, or three valence electrons while reactive nonmetals will have four, five, six, or seven valence electrons. All of them want to fill their valence shell in order to be stable. For nonmetals to completely fill their valence shell, they would then need to gain the missing electrons. Um, let's take, for example, fluorine. Fluorine has seven valence electrons, so it would need to gain one more valence electron in order to have a completely filled valence shell with eight. Or let's take oxygen, for example. Oxygen has six valence electrons. So oxygen would actually need to gain one, two valence electrons in order to have a completely filled valence shell. Now the story is a little bit different when it comes to the metals, though, because it would be much easier for them to lose the one, two, or three valence electrons they do have than it would be for them to gain five, six, or seven valence electrons that it would take for them to completely fill their valence shell that they have. So an atom like sodium, for example, with one valence electron, would be better off losing that valence electron, and therefore the valence shell underneath would now become its new valence shell, and this is one that is actually completely filled. So now sodium has become stable, not by gaining seven valence electrons, but by losing a single one and exposing the valence shell underneath um, in order for that to become its new valence shell. Now for atoms to lose electrons, they have to be gained by other atoms. So for an atom like sodium to lose its electron and its valence shell, though that electron has to be gained by another atom, like say for example fluorine, that needs a valence electron. Um, so metal atoms lose electrons by transferring them to nonmetal atoms. Now take a look at what happens to the atoms when they lose or gain electrons. As you can see, the metals become positively charged and the nonmetals become negatively charged. And that is because electrons have a negative charge themselves. So when metals lose electrons, the atoms now have more positively charged protons in their nuclei than they have electrons in their energy levels or orbitals. Whereas and the atom like fluorine, nonmetals, by gaining negatively charged electrons, they now have more negative charges than they do positively charged protons in their nuclei. So we call all these charged atoms, atoms that have gained or lost electrons and acquired a charge, we call them ions. And more specifically, positively charged ions are called cations, and negatively charged ions are called anions. What actually forms an ionic bond is not so much the transfer of electrons between metals and nonmetals, but the attraction between the positive and negative ions that are formed 
as a result of this transfer of electrons. An ionic bond is essentially an attraction between oppositely charged ions. So remember, opposite charges attract each other. So that's what's happening when an ionic compound is formed. When ionic compounds form, there will actually be millions of positively charged ions and millions of negatively charged ions produced. So when they attract each other to form an ionic compound, they arrange themselves so that same charges are not in contact while maximizing that opposite charge contact. And this results in the formation of a crystal. So ionic compounds tend to form crystals. In water, however, ionic compounds dissociate. That is, they are pulled apart by their attraction to the water molecules. And by the way, this is something that we will discuss in more detail in one of the upcoming lessons. The thing is that when we're talking about ionic compounds in biology, we're talking about ionic compounds in living bodies because living bodies are mostly water. So ionic compounds will always dissociate in biological systems and pretty much exist within cells as ions. Now you will learn in this course that ions, which are often called electrolytes, are very important to the proper functioning of living cells. In humans, for example, ions play a role in how we conduct energy, how we regulate our fluid balance, conduct electrical signals for both nerve signaling and muscle function, um, they're helpful in converting food energy into usable forms, regulating our blood pH, and many, many more. So even though ionic bonds are not that common in living cells, the ions within them are, and they actually help keep us alive. So let me give you an example of an extremely rare condition that can happen when ions are off balance. So you've probably noticed that sweat is salty, and that is because when we sweat, we not only lose water, we lose ions as well. We mostly lose sodium ions in our sweat, but also quite a bit of potassium and some calcium and magnesium ions. So let's say you've been sweating a lot after some intense exercise. And of course you will want to drink water so that you can replenish the fluids that you lost in sweat, which is what you should do. But in some very extreme cases, if you drink too much water too quickly, you can end up diluting the remaining ions in your body and throw off your electrolyte balance. And this could be really bad and can lead to a dangerous condition called hyponatremia. And by the way, this will only happen after intense exercise, like for example, running a marathon, and only if water is consumed too quickly right after. But one way this can be avoided is by replenishing not just the water that is lost in sweat, but also the electrolytes. So maybe drinking a sports drink like Gatorade or... Um, eating something that is salty or that contains a lot of ions like potassium, like say for example, eating a banana. And so this way you cannot just replenish the water that you lost, but also the electrolytes and avoid what is honestly a very rare condition, but that can happen, which is the dilution of the electrolytes and avoiding hyponatremia. Okay, now let's take a look at covalent bonding. Covalent bonds are by far the most common types of bonds found in living cells, and they are the result of the sharing of electrons between non-metal atoms. For example, let's take a look at how this works with hydrogen. Here you see two hydrogen atoms. Each of them has a single valence electron, and the valence shell they need to fill can only fit two electrons, so each hydrogen atom only needs one more valence electron to be stable. Sharing will achieve that goal. If the hydrogen atoms come close to each other, they can share their single electrons, essentially giving each hydrogen two electrons and stability. Unlike ionic bonds, which are the attractions between oppositely charged atoms, covalent bonds are more of a physical bond, resulting from the attraction the nuclei of each of the atoms have to their shared electrons. And we often represent covalent bonds by drawing a line in between the element symbols, like this. Compounds that are held together by covalent bonds are called molecular compounds, or molecules. And sometimes there can be more than one pair of shared electrons, like oxygen. Remember, each oxygen atom has six valence electrons and needs two more to be stable, 
So when two oxygen atoms form a covalent bond, they share two valence electrons each, forming what we call a double bond. Nonmetal atoms can share up to three pairs of electrons and form triple bonds. The more electrons that are shared, the stronger the bond. So of the three types of bonds, single bonds are the weakest and easiest to break, and triple bonds are the strongest. Now, electrons are not always shared equally between atoms. There is a property called electronegativity that essentially describes the level of attraction the nucleus of an atom can have towards the shared electrons in a covalent bond. And that level of attraction is not equal. Atoms of the element hydrogen, for example, have very low electronegativity, while chlorine atoms have a high electronegativity. When a hydrogen atom forms a covalent bond with a chlorine atom, the chlorine atom attracts the shared electrons much harder, and the electrons end up spending most of the time surrounding the chlorine nucleus and much less time around the hydrogen nucleus. Because of this, the hydrogen atom in this bond ends up with a slight positive charge, while the chlorine atom ends up with a slight negative charge. These are not full charges like we get with the transfer of electrons in an ionic bond, so they are actually denoted with a symbol delta. The hydrogen has not lost the electrons to chlorine. It is still sharing them, just not equally. In chemistry class, you may have learned that by calculating the electronegativity difference between the two atoms in the bond, you can tell whether the bond will be nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, or even ionic. The higher the electronegativity difference, the more the electrons will be attracted to one of the atoms in the bond, even to the point of no longer being shared and forming an ionic bond. Now, for biology class, we will not bother calculating electronegativity differences, since we mostly deal with bonds between oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and hydrogen, uh, we just need to remember that oxygen and nitrogen have high electronegativity values, and hydrogen and carbon have much lower ones in comparison. So bonds between carbon and hydrogen will be nonpolar, while bonds between nitrogen and carbon or hydrogen, or and oxygen and carbon or hydrogen will be polar. So just a kind of a shortcut so that if you just remember that, you not you don't have to be calculating electronegativity differences in order to try to figure out which of the bonds are polar or nonpolar. So not only can individual bonds in a molecule be polar, but sometimes the entire molecule can be polar also. A polar molecule is one that has an overall unequal distribution of charge so that one end of the molecule is slightly positive and the other end is slightly negative. The most perfect example for this is water. Because oxygen is much more electronegative than hydrogen, the two oxygen-hydrogen bonds in water are polar bonds. If you take a look at the shape of a water molecule, you will see that the two hydrogens are at one end of the molecule, and that means that the slight positive charges for hydrogen are concentrated at one end of the molecule, and the oxygen with its slight negative charge is at the other end. Now, having polar bonds does not guarantee that the entire molecule will be polar. Let's take a look at the example of water versus carbon dioxide. The bonds between oxygen and hydrogen and water are polar. And so are the bonds between oxygen and carbon and carbon dioxide. The two electrically charged regions on either end of a molecule are called poles, similar to a magnet having a north and a south pole. A molecule with two poles is called a dipole, di being the prefix for two. Both water and carbon dioxide are dipoles, and we can draw the direction of the dipoles as vectors uh, pointing from the least electronegative atom to the most electronegative atom with a small plus sign on the positive end of the bond. Once these vectors are drawn, you can see that in carbon dioxide, they cancel each other out so that the overall dipole moment of the molecule is zero. Meanwhile, in water, the vectors have an overall direction towards the oxygen, so there is an overall dipole movement uh, moving away from the hydrogen end of the molecule and towards the oxygen end of the molecule. This overall dipole moment gives the molecule opposite charges and makes water a polar molecule, while the canceling of the dipoles in 
carbon dioxide gas makes that molecule a nonpolar molecule. And whether or not a molecule is polar or nonpolar can actually be very important in biology. And so you need to be able to determine molecular polarity. That is a skill that you must have. And unfortunately, this skill actually involves quite a bit of advanced chemistry that takes into account the geometrical shape of the molecule, which is something you will actually not learn until grade 12 chemistry, if at all. And it also involves the like, vector sum addition of dipole vectors, which is kind of some advanced math. So for the purposes of this course, I am going to show you a shortcut that you can use to determine molecular polarity uh, for the molecules that you will encounter in biology class. Okay, so what you need to do to figure out if a molecule is polar or not is to look at three things. The first is the polarity of the bonds, then the number of bonds in the molecule, and then the symmetry of the molecular shape. So let's say we're trying to determine the polarity of this molecule of methane. We are first going to figure out the polarity of the bonds by looking at the electronegativity difference between the atoms in each bond. Now this molecule only has bonds between carbon and hydrogen and we established earlier that carbon to hydrogen bonds are nonpolar. You can do the math but the electronegativity difference is 0 0.4 which means that the bonds are nonpolar. So if the molecule only has nonpolar bonds then it is a nonpolar molecule. So methane is a nonpolar molecule. Now let's take a look at a molecule of hydrogen chloride. The bonds between hydrogen and chlorine are polar. So now we have to take a look at number two on the list, and that is the number of bonds. And as you can see, that there's only one bond. If there is a single bond in the molecule, and if that single bond is polar, then the molecule is polar. And so in this particular case, we have a polar molecule with a positive end, in this case hydrogen, and a negative end, in this case the chlorine. So hydrogen chloride is a polar molecule. Now let's take a look at the polarity of carbon tetrachloride. The bonds between carbon and chlorine are polar, so this molecule has four polar bonds. But now we get to look at its shape to determine its polarity. And what we're really trying to determine is whether or not the molecule has a symmetrical shape or not. And this is the part that can involve some advanced chemistry, but really can be broken down to a couple of things. The first is whether or not all of the terminal atoms are the same. And for this molecule, all the terminal atoms are chlorine. So yes, all the terminal atoms are the same. Next is whether or not there are any lone pair of electrons around the central atom, which for carbon tetrachloride, the central atom is carbon. Now, how can we know whether or not there are any lone pair of electrons? Well, we need to remember that in order to be stable, carbon needed to have eight valence electrons. And so we're going to assume that carbon will have eight electrons around itself in its valence shell, either in bonds um, with chlorine or not in bonds, which is what we call the lone pairs of electrons. So since carbon in this molecule has four bonds, and since each bond involves the sharing of two electrons, we can actually count eight electrons around the carbon, all of them in bonds. So both criteria for symmetry have now been applied to this molecule. All the terminal atoms are the same, and there are no lone pairs of electrons around the central atom. So this molecule is symmetrical and therefore nonpolar. So, carbon tetrachloride is nonpolar. Now, let's take a look at methyl chloride. This molecule has three nonpolar carbon to hydrogen bonds, but one polar bond between carbon and chlorine. Now, not all of the terminal atoms are the same, since three of them are hydrogen, but some of, but one of them is chlorine. So, in this case, both rules of symmetry don't apply, and as a result, the molecule is polar. So methyl chloride is polar. Finally, let's take a look at ammonia. It has three polar hydrogen to nitrogen bonds, 
So we need to take a look at its shape. And the central atom is nitrogen. Um, and the terminal atoms are three hydrogens. So it does have the same terminal atoms. But we now need to figure out whether or not it has any lone pair electrons around the nitrogen. And to follow the octet rule, like we did with the carbon, we would need to figure out whether or not nitrogen would have any lone pair electrons in order to make sure it has its eight valence electrons. So there are three pairs of electrons bonded to the hydrogens. Well, that makes only six electrons. So that means that nitrogen has one pair of unbonded electrons, or what we call the lone pair. So this molecule is not symmetrical, which again means that it's a polar molecule. So ammonia is polar. So polarity of molecules is extremely important to biology. One of the ways that it is important is because polarity of molecules determines the solubility of a molecule. And since we established earlier that living things are mostly water, whether or not something is soluble or not in water it can be extremely important to its properties within living cells. So nonpolar molecules are those that do not dissolve in water, and we call them hydrophobic molecules. Uh, polar molecules dissolve in water, and they are called hydrophilic. By the way, uh, both words come from the Latin uh, phobia, meaning fear of, and uh, philia, which means love of or attraction to. So hydrophobic molecules, technically or literally, um, the word means that they are fearful of water. And for hydrophilic, the word technically means that they are attracted to water, which is essentially what is happening. Now, the two types of chemical bonds we've looked at so far, ionic and covalent bonds, are bonds that hold compounds and molecules together. However, almost equally important for life are bonds or forces that can actually attract different molecules to each other, um, or that can attract different parts of a larger molecule together. These are called intermolecular forces, and they are weaker and easier to break than ionic and covalent bonds, but are nonetheless super important for living systems. There are three types of intermolecular forces which from strongest to weakest are hydrogen bonds, dipole to dipole forces, and London dispersion forces. And let's take a look at each of them one at a time. Earlier we learned that when hydrogen forms covalent bonds with oxygen it will end up with a slight positive charge and the oxygen in the bond will end up with a slight negative charge. The same is true when hydrogen covalently bonds with other highly electronegative elements like nitrogen or fluorine, for example. So if you have two polar molecules that are polar because of the unequal sharing of electrons between hydrogen and nitrogen, or hydrogen and oxygen, or hydrogen and fluorine, the positive charges in the hydrogen of one molecule can actually attract the negative charges in the nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine in another molecule. And this attraction is called a hydrogen bond. We will learn just how important hydrogen bonds are to biology within this course. For example, the double helix of DNA is held together by hydrogen bonds that are forming between the nitrogenous bases uh, within the two strands of DNA. Another intermolecular force is what we call dipole-to-dipole -dipole forces. And dipole-to-dipole -dipole forces are the attraction between opposite charges in different polar molecules. Well, hydrogen bonds, like the ones that we just saw, for example, are actually dipole-to-dipole -dipole forces, but they kind of get their own category because they are the strongest uh, dipole to dipole forces out there. So this category includes all other dipole interactions that may not be as strong as hydrogen bonds but are still a result of the attraction between polar molecules because polar molecules will have a positive end and a negative end and opposite charges attract and so the positive end of one polar molecule will attract the negative end of another polar molecule.
London dispersion forces are the weakest intermolecular force and the only ones that can occur between nonpolar molecules. So hydrophobic molecules or nonpolar molecules will still undergo London dispersion forces but will never undergo any type of dipole to dipole interaction. Even nonpolar molecules can form these types of um, attractions because they can form very temporary dipole moments, not because of an unequal sharing of electrons or having extra or missing electrons giving them a full charge, but simply because of the distribution of electrons within the atoms in the molecule. As you know, electrons surround the nucleus of an atom, but they can move within their orbitals or their energy levels freely and they're constantly in motion. So occasionally the electrons can somewhat gather on part of the atom creating what is called a temporary dipole with one side becoming more negatively charged and the other side more positively charged uh, because of the positive nucleus. Now this is a very temporary dipole with a very temporary unequal distribution of charge that very quickly dissipates the moment the electrons move back uh, around the atom and redistribute themselves. But if there's an atom nearby, the, while this dipole is in place, the positive nucleus can actually attract the electrons in this nearby atom and induce another dipole within that other atom. And so now you have two atoms in two separate molecules that have this slight unequal distribution of charge and can therefore attract each other. And this is a very transient, very quick, very um, dynamic attraction that quickly dissipates and disappears the moment that the electrons go back to being randomly distributed within their atoms. But if you have a large molecule with tens or even hundreds of atoms, you could have several of these very temporary attractions happening simultaneously, holding the nonpolar molecules close to each other. The larger the molecule and the closer the atoms in them can get, depending on the shape of the molecule, the greater the number of London dispersion forces uh, that will induce an attraction between the molecules. So. In this course, we will learn about nonpolar molecules like fats, for example. And these molecules will actually be attracted to each other by London dispersion forces. And how close they can be attracted to each other can depend on both the size of the nonpolar molecules and their shape. Um, the more atoms, the closer they can be attracted to each other because there would be more of these London dispersion forces the more their shape allows for the molecules to come in close contact. Again, the greater the number of London dispersion forces that can occur that will, that will hold the molecules um, to each other. And London dispersion forces, by the way, can actually happen to all types of molecules, including polar molecules. But due to the fact that dipole to dipole forces are much stronger than London dispersion forces, they're really not um, very important in determining the attraction between uh, polar molecules. But because nonpolar molecules do not undergo any type of London uh, dipole to dipole interactions, the London dispersion forces being the only force of attraction between them is uh, the one that, that, that counts for them. So that's the end of today's video lesson. And for this lesson, you had a challenge question that asks you to recognize the different types of bonds holding a structure uh, of a protein together. If you've answered the question, then I'm going to give you the answers now. If not, you can pause or stop the video now and then return to it when you are ready to check your work. Okay, so here are the answers. A was an ionic attraction between positively charged uh, sections of the molecule and negatively charged sections of the molecule. So because the ammonia, the NH3, has a very small, you can kind of see it, but it has a like a plus sign, um, and the oxygen in the 
attached to the carbon in the other part of the molecule has a negative sign, those indicate that they are ions or full charges. So you have a positive charge and a negative charge, and so opposite charges attract. That's what we call an ionic interaction or an ionic bond in a sense within this larger molecule. B shows hydrogen bonding both within polar components of the protein and between the protein and the surrounding water. So in both cases you can see that there is um, an attraction between um, the hydrogen of one molecule and the oxygen of another molecule. C is showing uh, a covalent bond between two, two sulfur atoms within the molecule. And so this is actually something called a, di a disulfide bridge, which is actually extremely important for holding the structural shape of proteins together and um, is a covalent bond right there in the protein. And finally, D is showing an attraction between nonpolar sections of the molecule. And so it has to be London dispersion forces. And by the way, there is another phenomenon at work here besides London dispersion forces. In, that is called hydrophobic interactions because not only are the nonpolar sections attracted to each other by these weak London dispersion forces, but they're also repelled by the water that surrounds the cell. And this is what we will always find when you have a protein the nonpolar sections of proteins are on the interior of the molecule as far away from water as possible. And you didn't obviously know about hydrophobic interactions, or I hadn't quite, you know, given that as a as an option for for this activity. So, you know, London dispersion forces was the correct answer, but I also wanted to mention that hydrophobic interactions do play a role. Uh, very important role in determining the molecular shape of proteins. So that's the answers right there and that's the end of the video. Don't forget to complete your quiz for this lesson and I will talk to you soon.